All right, so genital urinary and renal emergencies. You have our normal national standard competencies, yada, yada, yada. All right, so urinary system. One of the most important um, systems of our body, I would say, we rely heavily on this to filter, not, I don't want to say filter toxins because that's really the job of the liver, but this is for removing waste product from our blood and maintaining our blood pH um, balance. And that acid-base balance that we're familiar with from the respiratory system is being monitored and maintained through the renal system as well. So we'll see a little bit about that. We'll also be looking at why our why renal conditions and renal diseases alter our acid-base balance and how that affects the rest of our body's function. So, so remember your anatomy. Here we have the kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we have the kidneys, all right? So zooming in on the kidney. Remember in the kidney, you have two major sections of the kidney. You have the cortex and the medulla. You can see that here. The renal pelvis, uh, which collects fluid, our urine from the minor and major calyx, that's, you could call it the third region. Um, it's just a collection zone. It's not an actual function or um, it doesn't play any kind of physiologic role other than just collect it, urine and uh, diverted into the ureter. But the medulla and the cortex are the big part. That's the function of the kidney. And the nephron lies in between both of those. I realize it says right here that it is in the cortex. Well, it's actually part in the cortex, part in the medulla. And that's what's going on here. So let's look at a picture. So here you can see it zoomed in. And you can see the color dis disassociation or differentiation here in the bottom picture. This is the renal, um, or excuse me, this is the nephron. And the top part, the lighter colored, that is the cortex, the outer layer of the kidney. And then you have the medulla, which is the de depicted in the upper picture, the cross section of the kidney as the darker, redder uh, portion, almost kind of drawn like skeletal muscle. But that... Um, tissue there, that is where your lupa henle comes down. It descends from the glomerulus, which is in the cortex, and descends into the medulla. So your medulla of your kidneys is really built, made up of your loop of henle in each of those, um, from each of those nephrons. And there's like 250 million of these nephrons per kidney. There's a whole, so a whole lot of kidney function. All of our blood gets flu filtered through the kidney every few minutes. The What's considered glomular filtration rate is the amount of blood that's being filtered, not just blood being pumped into the kidney, but the blood that's being filtered through that glomerulus, creating a filtrate. And that filtration rate is about 135 milliliters an hour. So it's not an hour per minute, excuse me, 135 milliliters per minute. That's how much blood is moved, or not blood, but filtrate is formed from the glomeruluses every minute. But our urine output is only about 40, you know, we generally want to see it above 30, um, you know, 35 to 40 milliliters of urine per hour. That's the normal urine production. Now, you may have a condition where you have higher or lower, and that's generally lower than that, you're gonna have a problem. Higher than that, again, it's probably just because you're drinking a lot of fluids or something, or you have issues with your antidiuretic hormones. We'll get to that later on. But I want you to notice the difference. 135 milliliters every minute is coming, is being pulled out of the blood, but only 35 milliliters to 50 milliliters an hour is being produced as urine. Huge difference, huge discrepancy in that numbers. And so where is that problem? Why is that? Why do we have so much urine being produced in the glomerulus, but only a small amount being produced from the bladder or being released from the bladder? And the answer is the proximal 
convoluted, distal convoluted, and loop of Hemli. Those two tubules and the loop of Hemli all reabsorb that filtrate out of what we call the, well, it's called filtrate, and it reabsorbs the water out of the filtrate in order to make uh, urine. Urine has been concentrated in some way based on the needs of the body. So the way this is going to work, and um, so I think what I want to do, bear with me for one moment. All right, so now what I'm going to try to do is explain how this works in a more um, precise manner, um, maybe here. So, all right, so here we see the blood coming into the glomerulus, also known as the Bowman's capsule, and I should probably use a different color. Let's let's use yellow. So the the blood's going to come into the Bowman's capsule, and it's going to start to form urine right there. And we call this filtrate because it hasn't been um, diluted yet. All right, it's still in a very concentrated state. All right, so that filtrate will then flow this direction and so forth through the blood, through the body, and or through the um, proximal. This is the proximal right here, proximal convoluted tubule. And then it'll go into the loop of Henle, both first the descending and then the ascending. But notice this, the blood is coming out of the glomerulus, right? This, this is super thick, super concentrated blood coming through here. And it goes through the proximal convoluted tubule and then down, down what's considered the loop of Henle. So we have the ascending loop going up with the filtrate in it, but we have the blood coming down through the ascending loop. And the reason is we have super high concentrated blood with relatively low concentrated urine or filtrate coming past it. This swing or this large difference there is going to help absorb the fluids differently. Uh, but what we'll also notice here is we have a lower, this is where our high concentrated filtrate is, and this is considered our lower concentrated blood. So high, again, a very opposite, uh, the opposites. And these opposites between this here and this here, and then this over here and this here. So, right, the filtrate levels and the blood levels, that opposite is what allows the transfer of fluid and salt and things like that. So generally what we'll see is on this side here, along here, potassium and sodium can get absorbed into the blood. But on this side over here, water gets absorbed into the blood. So perhaps I should, for coloring purposes, say, this is where the water is, and what color should we use for salt? We'll just go with gray. Um, this is where sodium and potassium gets absorbed. This is where water gets absorbed. Does that, is, are y'all following me? And so the fact that one side f absorbs the filtrate while the, or excuse me, one side absorbs the electrolytes while the other side absorbs the water is what allows all of this filtrate that we are getting, that we're producing over here in the glomerulus to then be filtered back out. And that way our body will say, well, we don't need any more salt. So hormones will be sent to the renal tubules and say, stop absorbing salt like don't reabsorb it leave it in there or things like antidiuretic hormone may come here in the um proc or the distal tubule along here antidiuretic hormone plays a big role there and antidiuretic hormone will say um we don't want to diurese we don't want to make fluid so let's reabsorb lots of water right here and so tons of water will get reabsorbed in the um distal convoluted tubule. If the patient has a problem with antidiuretic hormone, so they 
aren't producing it. Their pituitary gland does not produce it. That is actually of um, a condition. They have no antidiuretic hormone, and we call that diabetes insipidus. Um, they are they are diuresing like crazy. They are producing tons of urine. Another condition is a level a high level of alcohol in their blood. Alcohol inhibits antidiuretic hormone. So as in, that alcohol is inhibiting the production or release of the antidiuretic hormone, all of this water is being left in that tubule, which is then flowing down, producing lots of very dilute urine coming through here, that very uh, light colored urine. This is one of the reasons, this is a plays a major fu factor in why you tend to urinate heavily after drinking heavily because the alcohol is that diuretic. It's blocking the function of antidiuretic hormone and that reabsorption of water. Some of our medications that we're gonna give are gonna play a big role in this. For example, if I give Lasix, Lasix is going to, um, help absorb more, uh, or excuse me, block, it doesn't absorb it, it blocks the absorption of potassium and sodium, but predominantly potassium here in the ascending loop. So if this concentrated blood that we see flowing this direction can absorb the sodium and the potassium out of the filtrate, there's now more sodium and potassium in the filtrate than there is in the blood. So what do you think is going to happen when the blood gets over here to this side, where you have high sodium and potassium levels in the here, low sodium and potassium levels in here, no, very little water is pulled back into the bloodstream. And that results in a big increase of urine production over here when we'll have very dilute and go for a really light color yellow we're gonna have very dilute urine being produced over here does that follow so that's an example of how our lasix medications working over here stopping that absorption of sodium and potassium blocking it prevents the reabsorption of water, and so now H2O is being blocked as well. And that's why more urine is being produced. With me? So, what do we know what do we need to know about this right here the glomerulus the glomerulus is this complicated knot or snarl of blood vessels and they're covered in little cells that have finger like projections along them and they wrap into each other like this all right so this would be you know that cell and you can see the opening in between, right? I have terrible drawing. And in between there is where, in this area, is where your red blood cell, not red blood cells, red blood cells are gonna get trapped, but all your urine is going to start leaking through. All your filtrate and some of your glucose or proteins or sodium, um, potassium, stuff like that is all going to leak through, but your red blood cells will be too big and won't be able to leak through and they'll stay in the blood. And so this is how that filter, and they literally, this is truly a filter. If you've ever used like a, a sieve or um, something like that, even like a colander to drain pasta or whatever, it's the same thing. But what happens if you're trying to, um, filter something uh let's say you're trying to filter paint or you're trying I'm trying to think of something that is a good example of this where you're trying to um, filter a substance through a filter but it keeps getting clogged right so um i don't know if you've ever made like various fruit juices and then you were trying to filter the juice um like the pulp trying to pull the pulp out of the orange juice or something like that but you know I mean, it's something I've done a few times. Um, but anyway, what you find is that filter starts to get clogged up. And when that filter gets clogged up, fluid no longer flows through it, right? You, 
you you have to change the filter out. And, and we, you know, you could use the example of your car. You you clog the fil oil filter in your car. You clog the air filter in the car. No, air or oil won't flow through them. You have to replace those filters. Well, this is what our glomerulus is going is doing right here. That's what we see in this. Con, um, the glomerulus, I'm trying to back up to where you can see that. All right, so right here in the glomerulus, um, that's what's being filtered. But how does that get clogged? Well, we've talked about uh, during shock when our blood vessels are being constricted, when cells are being damaged, we have myoglobins and cell particles and proteins and such like that being released into the bloodstream. These are all, all large diameter um, um, particles in our blood. Um, they're not as big as a blood cell, but they're much bigger than things like sodium and potassium and glucose. And so when they get into this glomerulus, they clog those filters and can't pass through. And well, when enough of those filters get clogged, that fluid isn't passing through, then you start getting a backlog of fluid in the blood and the kidneys aren't doing their job. For the kidneys to do any filtration, to make any urine, Fluid has to flow through Bowman's capsule. It has to flow from the bloodstream into the, uh, from the glomerulus of the capillary, excuse me, in the capillary, wow. In the glomerulus, blood has to flow through the capillaries in order to produce the filtrate in Bowman's capsule. That's what I was trying to say. So, how can we prevent that from getting clogged in the field? What are things that we need to worry about? Well, I just mentioned hypovolemia causes vasoconstriction. Um, shock and rhabdomyolysis and such like that cause cell uh, particles and cell particulate to enter the bloodstream and then clog that capillary. So what can we do? We give them fluids. We want to monitor and observe for those potential conditions and then give fluids in an aggressive manner to keep those capillaries in the glomerulus swollen. We want to keep them um, high flow volume through them. That way they stay stretched out. The filter stays pulled apart. That wide open filter will allow larger particulate through it. And then your chunks of proteins and such will f and cell membrane and myoglobin and all, they will flow through the glomerulus filter and into the Bowman's capsule and become part of the filtrate and then you will be able to urinate those out. If you've ever been pregnant or been close to somebody who was and they'll talk about having to get their urine tested every uh, time they go to the doctor, they're testing the urine for uh, proteins and those proteins would indicate because they are being shed from cells in the body and passing through that glomerular is passing into the filtrate that way and it gives an indication of is there cell damage is there stress going on in the body and so that's one of the things that are looked for on your analysis after a trauma patient is are they do they have protein in their urine do they have something like that going on that we need to watch out for and the treatment again is high volumes of fluid in order to keep those capillaries here in the glomerulus expanded you want to keep them open and hydrated so that they don't start constricting and reducing urine production is that making sense you guys with me any part of that that confused you or whatever the function of the kidney is complex. There's a lot of details here, but what I need you guys to focus on is a couple of points. And so I'm going to recap those. You want filtration here. How do we get filtration here? How do we maintain filtration at the glomerulus, at the Bowman's capsule? This is the part of the show where you guys talk back. How do we get filtration here in the glomerulus, in Bowman's capsule? What do we have to do with our patient and monitor with our patient to maintain filtration? This is the first stage of kidney function. 
yeah, adequate blood volume. Now we will monitor that by blood pressure being one of the indicators, but blood pressure alone is not a great indicator. And tell me why, or somebody else tell me why. It's important, but it's not the indicator we're gonna look for. So yes, cardiac output can affect our blood pressure, but remember when our body goes into shock, it compensates for the lack of blood volume and maintains the pressure. So a patient could have decreased fluid uh, blood flow in the kidneys and still have a good blood pressure. So we're gonna monitor their blood volume by observing, have they had um, fluid going in? Are they losing fluid or blood somewhere else? Do we suspect a dehydration? Have we seen a, a decrease in urine output and such like that? We wanna monitor and make sure there's adequate blood volume to keep blood flowing into the kidneys. So if you have a patient with a reduction of urine output, you wanna see, well, have they been coming dehydrated? Have they stopped drinking water? Have they, um, have they, had diarrhea? Have they been bleeding out? Have they been sweating excessively? Something along those lines. And so you want to watch for that. Um, so you're going to look for that kind of stuff. And then you're going to maintain fluids in order to keep that urine output functioning. Now you might be thinking, well, as a paramedic, um, not going to give my patient a urinal and monitor their urine output. And you know, when I pick them up at the house, you're correct. You're probably not. However, if you work for a private service, you're going to do interfacility transports, and on interfacility transports, your patients will likely have a Foley catheter, and that Foley catheter should always be emptied prior to um, leaving one facility, so that you can monitor that urine output during the transfer. Now, a point to make on that is if you're picking your patient up at like a nursing home or a residence, and they have a Foley catheter placed, and you're transporting them to the ER. I would not recommend emptying that urinary catheter there because in that short transfer, you're probably you're not going to be as focused on what is their urine output or is their urine output as much as what is the color condition and um, clarity of the urine. And the patient is likely going to be assessed for a UTI. And so we want to see, is there blood in this urine? Is there... Uh, particulate flocculent is there is it cloudy is it a dark color something like that and so when you're picking up from the emergency call you're probably not going to empty the catheter but if you're doing an inner facility transport you know hospital a says hey this vent patient needs to go to hospital b for further neurologic treatment they've got a foley catheter well empty that foley bag and then monitor urine output during transfer now if the minimum urine output for is 35 milliliters an hour and you only have a half an hour transport that means you want to see somewhere in the realm of 15 milliliters being um, produced during that transfer time so the reason you started zero you, you empty that catheter you want to make certain that you have a good idea are we producing urine because that's the first indicator is enough blood flow getting to the kidney all right, so you got to remember that the glomerulus filtration, blood flow, got to have that fluid volume. The second thing you want to remember is here along the convoluted tubules and the loop of Henle, this is where the majority of your electrolytes, which sodium and potassium are the primary, but your electrolytes and your water are absorbed. It, the ascending loop is the electrolytes. The descending loop is the water. And our Lasix will work, and I can't write, and that was a mistake. Lasix will work on the ascending loop and stop the absorption of electrolytes so that will reduce the absorption, uh, reabsorption of water. So the loop of Henle absorbs electrolytes and absorbs water. The distal convoluted tubule, which is this portion over here, this is where things like antidiuretic hormone work. You may also see aldosterone work in this section. We're not gonna. We'll talk a little bit about renin angiotensin aldosterone, but 
we don't focus on it near as much in pre-hospital because it's a slower function. It's a slower um, working system, so we don't see it as much. But antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is here on the distal convoluted tubule. And it is the last absorption of water from the filtrate. So if you have no antidiuretic hormone, lots of filtrate will be made. If you have antidiuretic hormone, fluid will be re water will be reabsorbed from that distal convoluted tubule then everything that's in the collecting duct right here this is called urine all right so it's filtrate over here in this area it's filtrate but in this area it's urine does that make sense everybody with me All right, so we'll go back to our screen here. So maybe that helped, I hope. At least somewhat, maybe. All right, so moving down from the kidneys, we have the genitalia. This is obviously the male genitalia. Uh, we will look a little bit at it here today with uh, certain disease processes that will be observed. We will see a little of the female genitalia as well, but we don't function near or we don't focus nearly as much on female genitalia in this chapter because they have their own chapter dedicated to them at chapter 22. And we'll see that in um, our special patient populations as gynecologic emergencies. So we don't focus as much on female reproductive and genitalia issues here, but we will mention it somewhat. All right, so um, obviously I did want to point out, you can see the scrot, not the, um, the prostate gland right at the base of the bladder. Uh, it's a rather large gland that produces a uh, lubricant. Um, this lubricant is necessary for the movement of urine down the urethra because the male urethra is significantly longer proportionately than the female urethra your female urethras are going to be like one and a half inches long generally whereas the male urethra from bladder to the um uh, urinary meatus that it's going to be pushing like four or five inches long so you can see a lot longer urethra on average this means more irritation and all that as the urine moves down it so the prostate gland produces a lubricant that keeps the inside of the urethra um, from becoming irritated as the urine is constantly flowing through it and keeps it, the cells healthy and all that but Prostate cancer, enlarged prostate, uh, blood pressure problems and all that can lead to that prostate um, swelling up and then restricting urine flow. And so that's one of the conditions we'll look at later on. You can see the mu uh, muscles there, Cowper's gland. You can see the ejacula uh, that's from coming from the testes. That's from the vas deferens. Um, and yeah, so of course the testes produce um, sperm and they play a major role in the production of uh, testosterone um, and male um, sex hormones all right um urinary and renal and gender urinary conditions while we're going to see a few of them they don't necessarily they don't normally come with associated hazards. It's not like trauma, like, oh, there was trauma, so something unseen may be dangerous, it'll harm us. Most of our renal and genital urinary diseases are going to be a slower um, developing and uh, have come from more benign causes and aren't going to be presenting us with specific hazards. Another thing to keep in mind is a lot of your general urinary and renal um, condition or complaints are going to be confused with abdominal issues. So while the patient might co complain of abdominal pain or perhaps they're going to complain of altered mental status or something like that, you know, completely different uh, appears to be a completely different body system, the actual cause is the um, renal or urinary. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. That I would say that UTIs 
urinary tract infections are probably the most common cause of altered mental status, person sick, person unconscious. Uh, if you have an elderly population, or in the elderly population, you get dispatched to an elderly patient, sick, uh, not acting right, or uh, confused, altered mental status, semi-conscious. I mean, it's so, it, I would say nine out of 10 times, it's gonna be a UTI of some sort. That's, I don't have science on that one. That's not a test question, it's just, it seems to always end up being the UTI. And because they're at significantly greater risk for it. We're gonna look at that. All right, so, um, you know, you got your general impression, ABCs, cool, cool, cool. Your mental status is all, and all is gonna play a big role. You're gonna have to really focus, or not, I don't wanna say focus on it, but you're gonna take note of that. And then also consider what causes altered mental status rule out the other causes you know medications alcohol toxins uh blood pressure issues cardiac issues respiratory hypoxia co2 retention you know rule all those out and try to narrow it down to being a renal condition all right during your history taking there there are a lot of questions that will help you point it out when did this start how did it start what did you first notice you know, did, did you have a, sens a burning sensation on urination or have you noticed increased frequency of urination? Is the patient bed confined and using, a, you know, adult diapers, or, you know, pads or, um, you know, have issues with incontinence? Are they straight cathing themselves? Do they have an indwelling catheter? Have they ever had conditions like this before? Has there been a change of color, cloudiness, or odor in the urine? These are things you're gonna to wanna to look for. Have they, uh, do they have a history of diabetes or high blood pressure? Oftentimes, high diabetes and high blood pressure are the most common causes of renal failure, and uh, we may, while renal failure tends to be pretty slow in a chronic state, um, acute renal failure can be caused uh, by a number of other things. And we'll look at some of those here shortly. So uh, a lot of this assessment is going to be based on our history taking and our questions that we're asking. So we, this is, you know, review from our abdominal. So we're going to move past that. Generally speaking, we're not going to be assessing our um, electrolytes in the pre-hospital environment. So I don't get hung up on that too much, but we will we will want to assess electrolytes from the standpoint of, hey, have you are you prescribed uh, diuretics, you know, HCTZ, hydralazine, or um, Lasix, things like that. If so, are you how are you handling your electrolyte balance? Are you um, taking electrolyte supplements like potassium and su supplements? Are you avoiding high salt foods or are you using um, sodium um, or salt substitutes and such like that? That's a, co a common salt substitute is potassium chloride. So people will season their food with potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride, um, which is table salt. All right, we already talked about, or I mentioned pain management before. Obviously, ABCs take the priority. Uh, pain control may be necessary, especially if you're dealing with someone with like a kidney stone or whatever, to try to help manage that. Typically speaking, when we're there, the patient's already been seen by a doctor. They already have diagnosed uh, with the kidney stone. They've been given medications to treat it. I'm not a big fan of throwing narcotics on board when the patient has already... Um, taken some form of narcotic or even uh steroid or not steroid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like um tordol or something like that generally let the doctor's prescription do its job and then transport them if that's um not working and let them you know work that out with their doctor but if they have not been given prescribed uh pain medication and this appears to be a, a kidney stone or something like that then uh it's your discretion, but it's encouraged that you treat that pain. All right, so UTIs, probably the most common renal condition that we're going to deal with. Urinary tract infections can be anything from an infection in urethra or the bladder all the way up to the kidney itself. Generally, we look at the lower urinary tract, consider it spreads there uh, or it starts there and then spreads. 
which patient population is at greater risk or likelihood for a UTI? All right, let's talk about why. Why are the elderly at an increased risk of UTI? You're not wrong. Let's just talk about why. All right, decreased mobility. They may not be able to make it to the bathroom in the time frame that they need to or um, are just not literally not able to get out of the chair and so they end up urinating on themselves through a form of incontinence where they are all right so sitting in that urine that does uh increase risk of uti so what are some other reasons yeah yeah they have a diminished uh, or a weakened immune system it's not as effective and so the infection can take hold faster than their uh, immune system white blood cells are able to fight it off good point yes others there are some other points here we need to bring out they are more likely to use a catheter than other populations that is correct so catheter use whether we're talking indwelling or intermittent like straight cathing both um place patients at a significant increase for um utis all right what's some others there's another big one here Okay, and that is associated with the uh, decreased mobility. Uh, um, you know, when there's a difficulty making it to the bathroom, the patients will often wear some form of um, absorbency material. That way they can prevent or uh, collect any incontinence. So, yep, that's another one. What I'm thinking of also is they have a decreased sensitivity and sensation to the need to urinate. They also have a decreased sensation to any, or excuse me, sensitivity to any pain or discomfort during urination. They have a decreased sensitivity to thirst. So they will often have reduced urine production, higher urine concentration, and will not notice if there's a uh, urgency to your a freak, more frequency or urgency or even discomfort like a burning during urination so they don't recognize most of the early um uh warning signs of utis and they don't uh utilize most of the um common methods of prevention like frequent urinate or um fluid uh con um yeah you know words they don't take in enough fluids they don't drink enough so they for they don't produce enough they don't flush things out enough so that's a big one all right what's a no so let's think what is another population that is going to be at an increased risk of utis So diabetics, because of their um, diminished immune system, decreased sensation and all that, they do have a risk there um, more so than others. Um, any other thoughts? Any other? Which will feed the bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody with a, de a depressed or... Um, altered immune system absolutely um so aids population and things like that another population that's at an increased risk of uti um would be young girls um especially when they're learning or um, hygiene and how to wipe um the risk of uti is significantly increased if the patient or the individual does not wipe after a bowel movement from front to back. So so for that reason, young girls tend to be at a much higher population, or excuse me, a much higher risk. Another risk is um, young people when they are first or becoming sexually active. They aren't necessarily using them cleanliness, uh, 
cleanest of methods and uh, habits with their sex, and so they are not voiding immediately after intercourse. It is very important for patients to, or for people to do that in order to clear uh, to prevent the UTIs. So uh, they used. To, we're going to talk about in chapter 22. We'll talk about pelvic inflammatory disease, which is essentially an infection that that comes uh, used to be called honeymooner syst uh, syndrome, but it's an infection of both the UTI and the uh, vaginal and uh, uterine tract where and it's the result of just frequent intercourse and not cleaning properly or not protecting yourself properly. So those are some, those are of course anybody who has an indwelling catheter so bedridden patients and that you know we mentioned the elderly and for the same reasons any bedridden chronic uh, medical condition patients you know paralysis and such like that so um, while in general women have a higher risk it is important to note that once uh, incontinence is an issue and when your uh, male patients are having to wear depends or having to use catheters the risk of UTI um, is basically the same between male and female population. A big concern with UTI, they will spread to other uh, organ systems and throughout the body. They are a very common cause of sepsis in our patients. So here's your classic symptoms. These are early symptoms, painful urination, frequency, difficulty, or just pain in general um, in the uh, urinary tract. And then later symptoms, Restless, uncomfortable, vital signs start to change. What are we going to do? Well, fluids. There's very little we're, we're going to be able to do. It's very supportive care. But one of the biggest benefits to a UTI is increased urine production. Because the more urine you're producing and the more you're flushing that kidney system out, the um, the better chance you have of removing the bacteria and moving um, and clearing the system out. But it will have to be treated with antibiotics. You can't just hope a UTI will go away. And while you may see somebody saying, oh yeah, just use cranberry juice or use azo or treatments like these over the counter and um, you know home remedies, these are amazing at prevention. And if you have those early signs, you know, that uh, urgency or frequency or maybe a little bit of burning with urination, but you haven't really developed a fever or any other symptoms, these may be effective. But once this UTI becomes significant, uh, cranberry and juice and such like that won't help. Um, well, I shouldn't say it won't help. It won't cure it. Um, it may help, but you're going to need the antibiotics to treat it here. Pyelonephritis is um, a severe infection of the kidney itself. It's when the UTI is spread all the way up into the kidney and uh, creating a much more con uh, concerning situation mentioned urinary catheters already, straight or full indwelling foleys. All right, um, here's some examples of urinary obstruction. Um, kidney stones, this would be the kidney stone has gotten stuck in the urethra somehow. More common in males due to the longer urethra, but still possible in females, especially if it's a large kidney stone and it's stuck right at the opening of the entrance of the urethra ab from the bladder. And so now the bladder is going to distend and not, they're going to have difficulty voiding. Uh, kidney injuries, all right? So this would mean maybe there's swelling in the kidney that's preventing urine from moving down the ureter. Uh, urethral obstructions with foreign bodies, abscesses or tumors, and then, of course, UTIs. Nerve damage or nerve conditions, like even like multiple sclerosis and such like that, MS, this is going to con alter the control of the of bladder sphincters. And with that altered control, the patient may have difficulty voiding. Here's some examples of incontinence. This is where the patient has a reduction of control, and so they lose uh, or they pass urine um, without intending to. So there's an example of a kidney stone. I'm sure that one, I believe that is a struvate. Um, no, struvate, excuse me. Struvate look like apple seeds. They're very smooth. Um, this kidney stone would be a very uncomfortable kidney stone to uh, pass. 
you can see its size there. And it isn't it isn't uncommon to have, for them to have to do some form of procedure to break the kidney stones up in the kidney itself to make it easier for them to pass along the ureter. So as you can see, uh, calcium stones are most common. These are the ones that tend to be fairly spiny, very uncomfortable. Uh, Struvate are more common in women and they tend to be smooth like an apple seed. And then you have your uric acid and cysteine, uh, cysteine stones. Some of these stones will straight up look like a, urchin, like a sea urchin, just tear everything up on their way out. But they used to have to do surgery pretty frequently for the treatment of kidney stones. Now they try a lot more less invasive procedures, but will go all the way up to uh, placing stents in um, a form of um, they'll put a camera up the your through the urethra and up the ureter and try to um, place the stent or remove the kidney stones that way. But they try uh, really hard to avoid surgery these days. Classic sign of presentation of kidney stones is the patient will complain of back pain. That's the early. And then there's, you may get dispatched for a complaint of abdominal pain. And they'll be saying, well, the pain started in my back and then it kind of moved around to the front and down low. That, that is your kidney stone. That is the kidney stone following the ureter from the kidney down to the bladder. So yeah, that's, that's it. Now, one assessment that you may be able to do um, in the field, it's, rare, it's really hard for us to um, palpate a hydro, um, hydro, hydronephrosis because this is a swollen kidney. It's up underneath our rib cage, so it's going to be harder for us to palpate it. They'll find this with an ultrasound, but in some cases it is enlarged enough to protrude below the um, posterior rib cage, and it can be noted. So as you can see, that kidney is a stone is causing the stricture. Urine is still being produced, resulting in a whole lot of pain in the back. Of course, that hydronephrosis is going to cause a lot of its own pain, and so they'll still be complaining of that uh, posterior back pain. Um, Even though you're dealing with a swollen kidney and you're dealing with a kidney stone that may be blocking a ureter, you still need to produce urine. So you need to do fluid resuscitation. Do not be afraid of giving fluids to a patient with a kidney stone. The more fluid, the more pressure, the more likely you will be able to um, clear that stone and get help them pass that stone. Amanda, why are you emailing me right now? It's a kidney stone. Is this something that everybody's going to want to see? Oh. Is that a... Um, is that a struvate? Wasn't tested. All right, let me flip to this so everybody can see it real quick. All right. So there you go. That's an example of a kidney stone. All right. And these are some of the uh, extracorporeal lithotripsy, the cystoscopy, that's where the stent placement is. Uh, they go up through the bladder, place the stent. Um, percutaneous, they're actually going to do surgery and drain the um, kidney th uh, surgically like that. Um, there are even con uh, processes where they use like a physical shock, not electrical shock, but like blunt force. Uh, to the kidney stones to try to break the kidney stones up or, um, from the exterior, basically punching the patient in the kidney. Um, essentially, the patient's not awake when this is happening, but the goal here is to start to break those kidney stones up while they're still in the renal pelvis or in the um, major calyxes of the kidney in, to help per, uh, pass them along the uh, ureters. So, all right, acute kidney injury. 
This is any time you have a reduction in your glomular filtration rate, your GFR. Well, remember I said earlier, this is supposed to be about 135 milliliters a minute. That's a lot of blood uh, filtrate being produced every minute. So um, critically ill patients will develop this, as you see, uh, up to 20%. Um, this is a sudden loss of kidney function, or should we say blood flow to the kidney. And so shock patients, uh, sepsis patients, um, things like that, these are where your patients are, these are your at-risk patients for it. And as you can see, once it happens, you have a fairly high mortality. This, this is what leads to acute kidney failure. So oliguria, you will not see a term dysuria, okay? Please hear me. In this lecture, we are not using a term called dysuria. You may see that word, but we are calling a decreased urine output oliguria, all right? Don't select dysuria. So oliguria, producing urine less than 500 milliliters a day, right? So decreased urine function or urine production. Anuria, this is the loss. Total, no urine production whatsoever. What's going to happen? Well, edema. People are going to uh, retaining fluid. They're constantly drinking fluid and all that kind of stuff. They're going to start retaining it. Edema is going to start building up. Uh, pedal, sacral, pulmonary, things like that. They're going to become acidotic. This is a metabolic acidosis. They'll probably start hyperventilating because they're trying to blow off CO2 in an effort to balance that pH back out. Uh, high nitrogen levels are going to go up. They're going to have a lot of bi uh, decreased low um, levels of bicarb in their blood, as well as a lot of other waste products um, causing fluid shifting the whole nine yards, it's a mess. It's a very rapidly uh, deadly condition. But what do we fix? It? Well, it can be fixed with temporary or um, emergency dialysis. It doesn't, um, doesn't mean it's going to be permanent. They can do uh, dialysis in the hospital and or try to treat the underlying cause of the kidney injury. So notice here, we have three classifications of kidney injury. We have pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal. And what that means is pre-renal is anything that prevents the blood from getting to the kidney, all right? Intrarenal is something in the kidney preventing the function or the production of urine. Post-renal is anything after the kidney that is causing a backlog of urine or preventing the urine from making it to the out of the bladder, either to or out of the bladder. So like a kidney stone stuck in a ureter, that could be post-renal. A um, enlarged prostate, post-renal. A um, muscle spasm of the pelvic floor muscles that prevent you from urinating, post-renal. But pre-renal would be dehydration, hypovolemia, um, if there are some conditions where patients are on a balloon pump where the balloon pump is dislodged and has now cut off blood flow to the kidneys. Now, that's not something that we're going to see a whole lot of. That's a critical care in our facility, very unique situation. But it's just an example of these are pre-renal conditions. Intrarenal conditions, kidney stone inside, infection inside the kidney, um, clogged glomerulus due to, you know, like rhabdomyolysis or something like that. So these are various uh, things that cause uh, intrarenal uh, kidney injuries. So um, what's, what's going to happen in the long run? We kind of already went over that. Um, of course, a big concern here, while you have the fluid shifting causing altered brain function and mentation, that's a concern you also have the um, electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia is developed, hypo, hypernatremia, you know, high so sodium and high potassium in the blood. These can lead to cardiac uh, dysrhythmias. As you can see, along QTs, um, but also to uh, elevated or um, peak T waves and things like that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
So what kidney failure will do is stop the production of urine. A patient doesn't realize that's necessarily happening. So you have a uh, increased production of um, or not production, but you're continuing to absorb fluids, but you're not getting rid of it. And then as your blood chemistry changes, it becomes more acidotic, it becomes more, um, you know, higher levels of potassium and all that kind of stuff. Fluid is going to start shifting into the blood, increasing the blood volume. This is going to stress the heart, stress the uh, pulmonary capillaries, and you'll start to see that third spacing in the, into the lungs. It isn't like it is a slower producing or, or a slower um, developing condition. Generally, you'll have other indicators first. Um, when your patient has a rapid uh, pulmonary edema, like a rapidly forming pulmonary edema, you're going to want to look cardiac. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I call um, calling an audible on that one. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very much more like the case. Remember, this is acute renal injury, acute kidney injuries. You're going to have some form of underlying injury or condition that has led to this. Why? And so you're trying to look this up. This isn't your chronic renal failure patient who, you know, diabetic hypertension, you know, their kidneys slowly decreased in function over the last 10 years. Now, sometimes a patient with acute renal failure and acute renal injury or kidney injuries, it could come, I've heard of it coming from food poisoning. They got food poisoning, turned to sepsis, became very uh, significant, killed their kidney, uh, they had renal failure as a result, and then it caused a permanent renal failure because of the damage, and they ended up having to need organ transplants. So um, this can happen in these kind of, in that kind of situation. But again, you want to look and say, why? What? What indicators do we have of reducing either hypoperfusion to the kidney, damage to the kidney itself, or a blockage of the urine after the kidney? Do what? And that's possible too. Did she miss dialysis? Because, but think about that. You've got a patient who's in renal failure. They got to go to dialysis three days a week. They haven't been to dialysis in a week. They're still not full of fluid or like their lungs, like everywhere else in their body is, but their lungs aren't necessarily because that process is slower. Yeah, yeah, that's one of those things that can definitely develop. So we've already kind of looked at some of these symptoms, you know, as you can see, anything that the pale moist skin, well, that would be pale, cool, moist, that's shock. Right? Decrease urine output, well, that's just evidence. Flank pain, infection, inflammation, injury, trauma, something like that. And then the mental status or heart failure um, signs in the severe. These are very severe acute kidney injuries lead to that. All right, we already mentioned some of these. The electrolyte changes on the EKG, peak T waves, um, such like that. And yeah, ABCs. So if the patient, you're suspecting acute kidney injury, but you think it's pre-renal, the patient is in kidney injury because of shock, well, then you're going to get fluids because you're trying to treat the shock and increase blood flow to the kidneys. If the patient is in acute renal failure, a failure because of post-renal issues, maybe like uh, trauma to the bladder, or trauma to their spinal cord, or trauma to, or, or they got a kidney stone or whatever, then maybe giving the fluids are not going to be the answer because you, you're just going to complicate the issue. All right, so now this will get into chronic kidney disease. We're going to talk about the function of the uh, dialysis and all that. So we're going to take a break here for now. So picking up where we left off, chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney failure. This is looking at um, conditions where there is a progressive loss of kidney function, a reduction of urine production and filt a reduction of urine production and reduction in filtration of the blood. Do um, hmm. you see this could be scarring in the nephrons? Uh, <clears throat> 
could be a number of different conditions. Mostly you're going to have like an acute renal failure of some sort that leads to a permanent scarring. That scarring is what closes up the glomerulus and you no longer can get the filtration through it. So whether that was um, damage from it being clogged or damage from uh, diabetes and the uh, microvascular issues there <clears throat> resulting in that permanent scarring. Those kinds of things what we're looking at causing this. This is not a condition that's necessarily going to develop overnight. So it'll be a slow progression through the stages and with a reduction of urine function and all that. Doctors will uh, attempt to treat it through various medications like diuretics. Um, Lasix is a common one in an effort to maintain function in the kidney. <clears throat> so here's some of your sympt symptoms that you're going to be looking for. <clears throat> Again, level of consciousness issues are so broad, so don't focus on those. Um, again, pericarditis, pulmonary edema, just because your patient has those doesn't mean that it's renal failure, doesn't mean that it's caused by the renal failure, but it could be. So you want to look at a bigger picture overall. You know, what's their history? What medical conditions have they had? What... Um, <clears throat> Do they produce urine? Do they have a history of hypertension and diabetes? What medications are they on? Um, changes in urine color. And then a lot of it's going to be diagnosed through lab work, looking at the kidney function and electrolyte balances. Now, <clears throat> we're not really going to uh, do a lot for this. What we're going to see here are patients who are in need of dialysis and are we're either taking them to dialysis or taking them to the hospital so that they can get dialysis size there. Oftentimes they already know this is the problem I have, this is what I need, and what we're going there. So as far as correcting chronic kidney failure, there's not much we're going to do. In fact, we're rarely even going to be giving any form of medications for these patients um, because there really isn't much we, at all possible. Um, <clears throat> so there you, so all right end stage renal disease could be caused by either chronic or acute um these are the patients who are um they need the dialysis they've missed the dialysis and we're taking them for that purpose so you see weakness, dehydration, fluid overload issues, uh, edema, so your edema, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, peripheral edema, that kind of stuff. Um, now, uremic frost. This one throws a lot of people, or I don't want to say throws them, but just it's like people get a little too worried about looking for it. Uh, it's not a very common finding. It, what this is is a patient who is in end-stage renal disease, who needs dialysis, who has not been dialysized, who has extremely high levels of urea and things like that in their blood. When they sweat, the sweat will include a certain amount of urea. And so they'll sweat, the sweat will, de will dry, and that urea will remain on their skin in crystal form. And so it creates like a white powder um, along on their skin. Most of the time you don't see it because movement and bathing or other, you know, light clothing and all that wipe it off and keep clear it off. So you may not notice it at first. The muscle twitching is going to be from the excess of potassium and calcium and such that hasn't been lost. Um, Coagulopathy, this is inability to clot due to the pH change in the blood. Proteins uh, like fibrino, fibrin will not function properly under the pH, uh, the more acidic blood. Uh, chest pain from cardiac function or respiratory distress uh, from pulmonary edema. And then your other findings of confusion, seizures, and coma, that is because of the fluid shifting in the brain resulting in... Uh, essentially encephalopathy. And here I am talking and not showing you the PowerPoint. All right. <clears throat> 
yeah, our supportive care for these patients is just going to be things like oxygen and such like that. We're not actually going to be able to do the dialysis or provide much help there. So, all right. So, what do we know about renal dialysis? Tell me a little about it. What's our experience with it? I'm, I know you guys have been seeing it out there. You've been doing dealing with dialysis transfer patients, but what do we know about dialysis? Talk to me. Yes, yes it is. It is bad when they miss it. So it says right here peritoneal versus hemodialysis. These are two different types of dialysis. What what do we know? What what's going on in this picture? Okay, and what method of dialysis is being used? All right, that is hemodialysis. And in hemodialysis, talk to me about it. Tell me tell me what we know about hemodialysis. Yeah. They pull off water weight. Yep, so their patient's going to get weighed before and after dialysis to calculate how much fluid has been removed because one kilogram of body weight is one liter of fluid. One kilogram of body weight is the equivalent of one liter of fluid. Okay. Moving to another location. Yep, yep. What are those? Yeah, is a surgical connection between the vein and the artery. So a fistula is where the two are brought together into like, and they're the ones that end up looking like a balloon or a bubble on their arm. Whereas the graft is like a tubing connection between the two. Or they use like a rubber tubing or plastic tubing because both of these have to be perform or um, in placed surgically. We avoid that extremity with our blood pressure cuffs if we can, so that um, in order not to cause damage or risk damage to that active graft or fistula, that way um, they don't risk um, having to have that surgery again. The uh, staff at the dialysis clinic are going to insert basically an IV needle. Uh, directly into that fistula. It's not like having to cannulate a vein. Um, it's very easy to get that line in there. And then, um, so they'll secure it or um, establish it that way. All the, the blood is pumped out of the body into the machine where it's passed through tubing that is surrounded by other fluid and the dialysis tubing is semi-permeable. So water is pulled off. Um, various uh, electrolytes, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, as well as urea and things like that are all pulled out of the blood. And then the um, molarity of the blood is evaluated and fluid is added back to it through saline and things and um, returned to the body that way. So that's what hemodialysis accomplishes. It can take a couple of hours for a process to go through. When a patient is interrupted in the middle of the process, it's very important that you know what, um, how far along they got, how much fluid has already been removed, how much fluid was intended to be removed. Um, so that's uh, some of the information you need. And then <clears throat> if they've missed dialysis, when was the last one they had? Why did they miss it? Um, and, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, I think that, yeah. Peritoneal dialysis, on the other hand, this is a process of where a needle is placed through a port, generally like a med port or something, 
and fluid is pumped into the abdomen. This is into the free space of the abdomen. Um, it's not intervascular, it's not intercellular. This is just the free space of the abdomen and surrounds the peritoneal lining of, or of the abdomen, specifically like the mesentery and all that. And then this fluid that's being pumped into the abdomen, saline, has a <clears throat> ton at that moment will have a very different tonicity from the blood because the blood is full of extra chemicals and extra um, you know waste product. So fluid is pumped in, sits there for a little bit, and waste products move by diffusion from the blood of the mesenteric lining and or the mesenteric tissue in the peritoneal lining mo moves by diffusion into the fluid and then the fluid is sucked back out of the abdomen and fresh fluid is placed and this continues in i think if i remember right they're like 30 to 45 minute long cycles and the patient will generally hook themselves up to this machine go to bed and then it'll run six to eight hours overnight <clears throat> so this is done at home generally by the patient themselves and takes a very long time so it's important to know when did they start it did it finish and things like that of course there are associated problems if the machine breaks down or something like that fluid keeps filling the abdomen or too much fluid is removed that kind of it generally the fluid removal issue isn't the problem as much as if the fluid is left in the abdomen too long um, creating too much of a absorption or change in their blood chemistry there's pictures of your fistulas and grafts um that fistula picture in my opinion is grossly underrepresents what a fistula will look like you know that makes it look like it's just this nice little line when in fact that most of the time they've swollen out to large balloons all right so um here's some of your example some issues related to fistulas or not fistulas to dialysis cramps why would a patient suddenly have muscle cramps while doing dialysis Yeah, electrolytes, specifically uh, potassium, just kind of like when you're sweating too much and you sweat off all your potassium or your sodium and you start to get muscle cramps and such like that. Same kind of a thing. So, um, of course, infections and all that. Another interesting concern is the fact that a lot of patients who use dialysis ports, like a, which is an indwelling catheter, sub, um, generally subclavian, um, central line, on one side of their chest uh, they are a two lumen port and they have to be stored with heparin in them because it's going to be sitting there for a few days without being accessed if the heparin is given in the wrong concentration or is inadvertently pushed into the central circulation they can have uh, significant bleeding complications <clears throat> All right, so hypotension shock, I think that makes, um, ought to be evident because they pulled too much fluid off. Potassium, mentioned that somewhere else already. Air embolisms is if you can't control your tubing and all that and air starts getting pumped into their bloodstream, causing the embolism. Disequilibrium syndrome. This one tends to uh, confuse people a bit. And so I want to take a moment to discuss this disequilibrium what does that sound like what does those words mean to you yeah it's the opposite of equilibrium stuff is off balance we've had an alteration up and but what do you think this imbalance is what what is out of balance All right, so what we're talking specifically about is the um, 
you would say electrolytes, but also things like urea. So when the blood has built up these levels of urea, uric acid, uh, waste products, and such like that for a period of time, it starts to diffuse into things like the cerebral spinal fluid. You run them through dialysis, you pull all of that excess electrolytes and uric acid and all that out of their blood, and you've now lowered the concentration of the blood but it hasn't had an effect yet on the concentration of the cerebral spinal fluid because that those um, uh, particulates have to um, diffuse back into the blood first. Well, the initial reaction there is going to be a shift of fluid of water out of the blood into cerebral spinal fluid and into the cells and things like this. This will result in intracranial pressure. This will incur, result in a relative hypovolemia and uh, that intracranial pressure will and see, will um, create a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Altered mental status and confusion. And so that significant altered mental status post uh, dialysis, that's what we're looking for with disequilibrium syndrome. But because of the chemistry here, you may also end up with a patient who is hypotensive because the potassium or the calcium is shifting out of their muscle cells in their heart and they're not causing vasoconstriction. They're not accomplishing adequate cardiac contractility and things like that. So these are some of the good examples. Uh, some of the concerns that may come along with uh, dialysis. Uh, so when treating a patient who is on dialysis or has missed dialysis or is having some other emergency associated with it, we want to make sure we determine when did the symptoms start? Did they have the symptoms prior to dialysis? Did it start during their dialysis or did it start after their dialysis? A condition prior to dialysis may be corrected with completion of dialysis. It's very common for us to go to dialysis centers and find out uh, for chest pain or shortness of breath or whatever, and they're like, well, yeah, the patient had it when they got here, be and we started dialysis thinking that was the problem. Well, now they're finishing dialysis, their shortness of breath isn't improved, so maybe it's something else, possibly. Generally, if it's during dialysis, of course, you know, anybody can have a heart attack or stroke or asthma attack at any time, but you want to look at how much fluid has been removed and what their current blood lab or lab values are. They often will do lab values during dialysis treatments at the end and all to identify if their potassium is okay, if their calcium, sodium, and all that. And if those get off, you might have cardiac disturbances. With your post dialysis patients, you're looking at your disequilibrium syndrome, you're looking at your uh, volume deficits, and oftentimes then when you start shifting these chemicals enough, the patient won't be able to, uh, well, I mentioned the vasoconstriction and the cardiac output, or cardiac contractility already. So this leads to a bradycardia and a hypotension it's not necessarily a lack of fluid volume is because they, they're really good at monitoring that. It's very rare for you to have a fluid volume issue. It is a lack of electrolytes being where they need to be. That tends to be the bigger concern. So, all right. Um... All right, so conditions that may be associated with male genitalia. All right, uh, epididymitis and an infection of the epididymis. This is the tissue that surrounds the um, back of the testes can get inflamed and infected there. Ocritis, this is when the actual testy itself is inflamed. Not much we're gonna do for these things. It's more or less like, oh, that's where the redness and swelling is okay, that's probably this type of infection. Um, most of these types of infections are the direct result of STD infections. Now, Fournier's gangrene is a little bit different. This is an infection of the skin of the scrotum itself, um, specifically the posterior of the scrotum. Um, and you know, you got to think about it. Um, the life as a scrotum kind of sucks, right? Because of who your neighbors are on one side and the other one's a dick the other's a butthole so what 
what is it that, why are women more likely to experience a UTI than men? And that's because of the length of the urethra and the proximity of the urethra to the anus and fecal matter and uh, fecal coliform bacteria being present in and entering the urethra. Well, for men, the issue is if they get any type of laceration, abrasion, cut, tear, whatever you want to call it, on the scrotum itself, you're so close to the anus that the risk of an infection developing is very high and that infection can be quite severe. So um, if an infection forms with those um, enteric bacteria, well, it turns into what's called Fournier's gangrene. It's very foul smelling. Um, as you can see, it gets into the subcutaneous tissue, uh, down into the muscle, <clears throat> and uh, will have a significant change of color in that tissue. So this is an emergency. This is considered a uh, prompt transport required. Um, patient's gonna need IV fluids as well as IV antibiotics because without um, treatment, this will result in necros necrosis and loss of the male genitalia in that case. So we, uh, we wanna move pretty quick with that type of a condition. All right, priapism. Many things can cause this. You know, since the what was it, early mid um, early two thousands, it was um, you know if you uh, erectile dysfunction medications could result in it. Prior to that, you know, we were looking at, frequently at things like nerve uh, damage from the spinal cord and stuff like that. While it can be painful, it is not necessarily life threatening. Uh, another cause is sickle cell anemia sickle cell can lead to priapisms the point here or the big concern here is if it's not nerve origin and even if it is the concern is the clotting of the blood within the corpus callosum did i say that right no at the corpus callosum um why that's in the brain why am i blanking anyway wrong head right that's what it is cavernosum thank you so corpus cavernosum so when so basically that is just like hollow tissue that has a lot of blood flow into it and when the arteries dilate due to stimulation and hormone release the artery dilation results in a um, restriction of the veins so the artery into the corpus cavernosum dilates out restricts the venous blood return essentially doing what we do with a uh, iv tourniquet it's like putting an iv tourniquet onto it resulting in a compartmentization of the blood so the blood starts inflating it and that's where the erection comes from well if you stop the venous flow out of the corpus cavernosum long enough the blood that is now stagnant in the corpus cavernosum will start to clot that will result in an inability to remove those um that blood as well as the risk of um, transferring blood clots to other parts of the body so that's where that's a big concern this is why a um, sickle cell crisis can result in priapism because of a log jam essentially the blood vet cells can't make the red blood cells can't get out of the corpus cavernosum and the erection uh, lasts and then damage can happen uh, if this can't be reversed through like ice packs and such like that it early on which that works early on it doesn't work later on then one the most common treatment or most likely treatment is they have to go in with very large gauge needles and extract the blood and the clots um, with syringes and large bore needles um, th through the sides of the corpus cavernosum. So very pleasant, very, very enjoyable experience from what I've been told. That was sarcasm um, for the recording's sake.
All right, so this is phimosis, an infection or that results in the inability to retract the foreskin. Cold compresses, they may need an antibiotics, but not something that is necessarily life-threatening or emergent. This is, in the, this is paramosis or paraphimosis. This is where the infection, again, normally caused by STDs, is uh, caused a swelling of the glands penis, and that means the foreskin has retracted and is now constricting it. And instead of creating a priapism for the entire uh, corpus cavernosum, you're basically getting a priapism of just the glands penis, and that can result in necrosis in the long haul. So those are some conditions there to be aware of. All right, I mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture, benign prostate hypertrophy. This is a swelling and enlargement of the prostate gland that's at the base of the bladder at the beginning of the urethra. The prostate gland plays a role in the production of semen and um, the mixing of the sperm and the semen, and as well as the um, lubrication of the urethra. Well. If it is enlarged due to hormone balances, cancer, or other concerns, it can constrict that. And our patient is going to end up having a difficult time urinating. This could, and this is where we would see it, is if this was resulting in an acute post-renal renal failure. So the inability to void the backlog of urine into the kidneys and things like that. <laughs> All right, testicular masses, generally they're cystic, but occasionally it might be an, an a, in, um, tumor. So therefore, if somebody calls you at three o'clock in the morning, because that's when the people like this call to tell you that they have a lump on their testicle, well, you know, normally they're cysts and no, nothing to be concerned about, but otherwise, um, occasionally they're cancer, um, but not something that requires pre-hospital uh, treatment or anything like that, or even emergent transport or EMS transport. <laughs> now, testicular torsion, on the other hand, is a very different thing. This is where the testicles have been rotated within the scrotum, resulting in a cutting off of the blood flow into the testicle. Um, Generally, it's one-sided. It almost always happens as a result of trauma, blunt force, and it typically it's actually blunt force trauma. Um, so it's kind of odd that uh, how that happens. I'm not really certain why blunt force trauma can result in that torsion or that twisting, uh, but that is the most common cause of it. I, know, I haven't treated a patient with torsion specifically, but I have treated a patient who had the similar result. This individual was um, had an elective vasectomy, but instead of clamping the vas deferens, they clamped the testicular vein and the artery kept pumping blood into the testicle, but the vein couldn't allow the blood to release. Uh, to leave the testicle, the testicle had swollen to the, about the size of an eggplant and it was the same color as well. Um, so very significant um, swelling and issue there. Tor testicular torsion or any type of occlusion of blood flow to or from the, the testicle will result in an emergency surgery to re repair it so that you, in an effort to preserve that sex uh, organ in because of its release of hormones and hormone regulation in the body. So that's the reason that it uh, is considered to be a surgical emergency. And yep, I think we went with fractured penises back in trauma, so we're not going to get into um, that today. So that wraps our chapter 21, renal and GU.